Hello everyone. Welcome to session 11 of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. I'm Frank Harrell. Glad you're here. Um, as always, um, if you're viewing this live, uh, please engage in the chat by activating the chat uh, window under YouTube and set the chat mode to live. And if you are viewing this after uh, the premiere of the recording, be sure to use datamethods.org as uh, listed on your screen uh, for offline discussion and questions and answers. So this is a continuation in session 11 of what we covered in session 10, which was nonparametric test. And in uh, session 11, we're going to show that the Wilcoxon two sample test and its case sample generalization, the Krusko Wallace test, are uh, just special cases of a particular model. And if we use that model, we can do a lot more than we can do with our regular nonparametric tests. Uh, that will also lead to another thing that we'll be able to do today, which is to show how to do power and sample size calculations that are really for the Wilcoxon test because uh, once we have this uh, more general way to model things, uh, we can use the, the model, which is the proportional odds model, as a basis for power calculations, and that will apply to the uh, Wilcoxon test. So let's get started by going to our notes, and the notes I'll be showing are dated uh, January uh, 22nd, uh, uh, 2020. Here we introduce the proportional odds model, uh, which is a generalization of the Wilcoxon and Krusko Wallace tests, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, now, for something to be a generalization of a rank test, uh, one thing that would have to be happen is that it uses only the ranks of the dependent variable, and that indeed is the case with the proportional odds model. The the way that it's a a generalization is of the three test statistics, likelihood ratio, walled, and score tests. Uh, the score test that arises from a proportional odds model that has just the two groups in it um, is exactly um, the Wilcoxon statistic, or more precisely, the numerator of that score st statistic is exactly the Wilcoxon statistic. Now, a special case of the proportional odds model um, is also the ordinary binary logistic model. Um, and the proportional odds model was developed by Walker and Duncan in a Biometrica paper in 1967. Now there's many advantages of the modeling approach over just using the standard nonparametric test. Uh, big advantage is you can adjust for covariates. You can't do that really at all with the uh, Wilcoxon test. Uh, and a sort of a subtle advantage is uh, the model-based approach can give more accurate p-values when you have an extreme number of tied values in your dependent variable. And then we'll talk more later about this one. This is a little bit harder to understand, but uh, it provides a consistent framework for doing pairwise comparisons in the context of a multiple group problem where you have more than two groups, and so you have more than one pair that you can examine at a time. You can also get estimates from the proportional odds model. You can estimate all kinds of things. Exceedance probabilities are what are immediately estimated, but you can also estimate quantiles if the dependent variable is fairly continuous, and you can estimate means if it's interval scaled or almost interval scaled. Another advantage of modeling is it sets the stage for being able to do a Bayesian proportional odds model so you could get the Bayesian equivalent of a Wilcoxon test, which otherwise we would not be able to get. Now, besides the proportionalized model, there are other ordinal response models that are available. The most popular of all is the Cox proportional hazards model, which is usually used for censored time to event data. But there are some wonderful applications of the Cox model where you have time not being the variable analyzed and where there's no censoring. Now, why are these models like Cox and proportional odds model called semi-parametric? Well, in terms of assumptions, they're sort of halfway between non-parametric and fully parametric. Uh, they're 
They're parametric on the right-hand side of the model equation because you have beta coefficients uh, that are multiplying your um, variables or some transformation of your variables. And we tend to write the models in terms of having additive effects and by default linear effects, and that makes it uh, also parametric. The models are not parametric on the left-hand side of the model because you're not assuming a distribution for the response variable. So that's why we call it, because it's, it's parametric on the right, non-parametric on the left, we call it semi-parametric. Um, like non-parametric tests, p-values that arise from the proportional odds model or from the Cox model are not affected by transformations of the outcome variable as long as uh, the transformation is like always going up or always going down. It's monotonic. So that's a very nice property. So we need to define the proportional odds model. Uh, so let's suppose that our response variable y has k distinct values that are uh, occurring in the sample. And we're going to label those distinct values as y1, y2, up to y sub k. A semi-parametric model has k minus 1 intercepts. Now contrast that with a binary logistic model where we're only talking about a single event, which is usually denoted y equals 1 versus y is equal to 0. With an ordinal model with k distinct levels, you'll need a reference level, uh, but you'll have k minus 1 events instead of just one event. And so a very useful class of models uh, for uh, semi-parametric modeling is the class of cumulative probability models. So we're going to model these events in, a, um, in an upward fashion, and we're going to accumulate probabilities uh, by adding little probabilities, like the probability that y is equal to something, uh, you get the probability that y is greater than or equal to something. So that is a cumulative probability, uh, like you would have in a cumulative incidence function or survival curve uh, or CDF. But we're writing this in terms of exceedance probability. It's actually equal or exceeding. So given this set of covariates x1, x2, and so on, uh, the probability that y is greater than or equal to little y given x is this logistic form. Now that form looks just like a binary logistic model, except the binary logistic model we wrote beta 0 as the intercept. And here we're going to have more than one intercept um, uh, when, say, k is greater than 2. And um, we're going to index the intercepts by y. So we're going to let alpha sub y be the intercept that corresponds to this cutoff for the, the values of y. So that's in the place of beta 0. So there are a lot of these intercepts. And uh, the alpha y is going to be the jth intercept in terms of counting how many intercept terms there are when y is equal to y sub j plus 1. Uh, and so the first intercept corresponds to the second smallest value of y. And that's because we don't need to model the probability y is greater, greater than or equal to the minimum y, because that's always a probability of 1. Now, we're going to be developing in this chapter not a general regression with proportional odds, which is actually very nice to do, but we're just talking about the two-sample problem to correspond to the Wilcoxon test. So if you say the probability of exceeding or equaling y, uh, given what group you're in, then the model reduces to this special case, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus, and then you add in the appropriate intercept corresponding with the cutoff you're currently looking at, uh, plus your regression coefficient, beta 1, times an indicator of whether or not you're in group B. Uh, so that's going to be a 1 if you're in group B, 0 otherwise. And what this implies is that the analog of beta 1 is the odds, the ratio of odds of being at or greater than y in group B divided by the odds of that exceedance probability if you're in group A. 
and that ratio is not depending on the cutoff y. Uh, so for any y greater than the smallest y, you're going to get an odds ratio by taking the ratio of odds of the exceedance, um, and, and the odds ratio is not dependent on the cutoff. That's why it's called the proportional odds model, um, and that's the assum a key assumption that we need to make. Now, if beta 1 is positive, that means uh, the y values tend to be higher in group B. Now, an interesting way to talk about the intercepts is since there is one intercept for every distinct value of y except the minimum, uh, these intercepts encode the entire empirical cumulative distribution of y for one of the groups, say a reference group here, group A. And since you have an intercept for every possible value except the one you don't need, the minimum, uh, that means the model is assuming nothing about the y distribution. Uh, the fact that it has beta 1 to model the group effect, that tells you how do you jump from group A to group B. And so what the model is modeling and what it's assuming is nothing about any one group's distribution at all but it assumes how the distribution for one type of subject or one group is connected to the distribution for another type of subject. There will be a certain kind of similarity of the shapes of the distributions. The proportional odds model for a two-group problem assumes that the logit of the two cumulative distribution functions are parallel. If proportional odds doesn't hold, that doesn't mean the model is uh, no good at all. It may not be optimal. It may still be robust and better than most of the alternatives that you could name. Now, um, proportional odds is also what the Wilcoxon and Kruska-Wallis tests need to have optimum power, since they're special cases of the proportional odds model. In R, the RMS package has a function ORM for ordinal regression model that will fit the proportional odds model and several other models with different link functions than the logit. And the ORM function is really made expressly for continuous Y. It'll work fine with discrete ordinal data, but where it really has advantages is how it handles um, a huge number of distinct values, very, very computationally efficient. Uh, so you could easily have 6,000 intercepts in a model um, and it will still run fairly fast. So uh, when the sample size is really large and you don't have many ties in the data, you'll have a lot of intercepts. Now the fact that you have 6,000 intercepts in a model uh, doesn't mean that your sample size needs to be really huge. You're not really estimating free parameters as you do on your betas because all the alphas are forced to be in order. So there's an ordering restriction based uh, on the fact that we're doing ordinal regression that makes the number of intercepts not be a problem. Now before going into the proportional odds model for the Wilcoxon two-group situation more and and later talking about power calculations, uh, we're going to stop for a moment and talk about the Kruska-Wallis test, which is called the rank analysis of variance. So this is the extension of the Wilcoxon test when you have more than two groups. Uh, and you could learn the formulas for a Kruska-Wallis test, but you really, once you get into modeling, you get sort of spoiled. You don't need all these formulas. And so just form a proportional odds model that has more than one indicator variable in it and test uh, for the diff for any differences among any of the groups uh, or between any of the groups and you'll get um, the cross coalesce test already. So let's suppose we had four samples from four populations. So to describe four samples, A, B, C, and D, we're going to need three indicator variables um, and our indicator variables are going to go for groups B, C, and D. We'll let A be the reference cell, which corresponds to the intercepts in the model. So what does the model look like, the proportional odds model, when you have a four-group problem? 
So the model assumes that the log odds or logit of the exceedance probability given the group that you're in is equal to the appropriate intercept that corresponds to that cutoff over here um, plus the effect if you're in group B, a, a different effect if you're in group C, a different effect with beta 3 if you're in group D. And so that will describe all possible differences uh, in four different uh, samples. And then if we use the likelihood ratio test from the proportional odds model with three degrees of freedom, we're testing the null hypothesis that all four distributions are the same. And this will solve a transitivity problem that was alluded to earlier in this session where you can get nonsense results by uh, doing Wilcoxon tests to do pairwise comparisons uh, after you do the kruska wallace test. And the reason that problem occurs is in the kruska wallace test, you're going to rank all the data, no matter which of the four groups you're in, the, you will rank, say, from 1 to N. Um, and then the kruska wallace test uses that one ranking uh, to look to see if there's differences in the groups. Whereas if you do a pairwise Wilcoxon test, you're going to take all the data, say, in uh, group B and all the data in group C, and you're going to re-rank those, uh, uh, the, the outcome variable, in just in the subset of B or C. So it's that re-ranking, and then if you compare C to D, you'll re-rank your Y variable again. That, that re-ranking can create inconsistency. So with a proportional odds model, as with the kruska wallace test, you're not going to do re-ranking, you just have one ranking. And so you can do pairwise comparisons that are consistent. You can form odds ratio for any comparison. So if you look at the model above, uh, beta 2 is the, uh, multi it's the multiplier for being in group C, and uh, group A is, is going into the intercepts. That's a reference group. So beta 2 is comparing group C with group A, so if you took the analog of the beta 2 estimate, you're going to get the C to A odds ratio. If you wanted to get C to B, well then you need to compare beta 3 with beta 2, and the, the group A sort of cancels out of there. So the odds ratio for the C to B comparison is the analog of the difference uh, beta 2 minus beta 1. Now one thing that you should be reacting to at this moment is that you're not used to summarizing group differences with an odds ratio. We do that uh, all the time with a binary outcome, but not so much continuous or ordinal outcome. So why are we talking about odds ratios? Well, that's the way the model is built, and that's the thing it's assumed to be constant. Uh, but you can take the model and translate it to me medians and means, um, and and the original non-parametric tests don't really do that. You you have other sort of estimates of location, like the um, hodges lehman estimator. Um, but with proportional odds model, we can estimate the population quantiles and mean straight from the model. And there's a footnote down here about what it means to get a predicted mean. In a discrete distribution, you just have to take differences and exceedance probabilities and that gives you the individual cell probabilities, and you multiply those by the Y value they go with and add them up, and that's just your weighted uh, combination, and that will give you a predicted mean quite easily. And R in the RMS package, as we'll see later, makes that especially easy to do. Um, so we're going to il illustrate this with a non-proportional odds example, and we're going to check to see how well the proportional odds model can recover the sample means assuming proportional odds when we shouldn't quite assume that. So uh, we're going to take four samples from normal distributions with the same variances but having different means. Now those samples are just shifted from each other in an additive fashion by shifting the mean um, and that's not the way proportional odds works. The distributions under the proportional odds assumption, you don't just shift the mean, you shift something different. Um, but we'll see that the, um, the means that you estimate are not that different from the sample mean. So this particular problem where uh, it's a normal distribution, uh, it's not that far from being non-proportional odds. So it's 
you'll see it works pretty well. So we're going to generate um, 100 samples from each of four, um, four treatment groups. And then we're going to have 400 random normal uh, Y values uh, in group A with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And then in group B, instead of having a mean of 100, it's going to have a mean of 110. Group C is going to have a mean of 120. And group D, since the offset is 30, we're going to have a mean of 130. So we're just generating the classic sort of ANOVA setup uh, with a normal distribution. And then if we say ordinal regression model, where this continuous Y variable is modeled, uh, as a function of group, it will generate the three indicator variables and give us this output. So we see the likelihood ratio chi-square is very large. It has three degrees of freedom, like the Kruskal-Wallace test, and a very tiny p-value. Uh, and you can also get the score test uh, that's a little more like the Kruskal-Wallace test. And so, and, but it's, it's also a very huge chi-square, none of this matters. We have a generalized R-squared measure called a pseudo R-squared, and then we have a Spearman's row between predicted and observed, and various other measures. So you can see there were no ties in the data. All the Ys are distinct. And then we get our estimates. I'm not bothering to show 399 intercepts here, but we're just showing the beta hat estimates. So you can see as we go from group A to B to C to D, as you sort of think of group A as a beta of zero, uh, you see the betas go up, so the, the samples are shifted with higher values as you go up from A to D. And that's the way we generated the data, so thank goodness that's in agreement. So now we're going to get a predicted uh, set of predicted means from the proportionalized model we just fit. So there is this function generator in the RMS package called mean with a capital M. That means to create an R function that takes the linear predictor and translates it to the predicted mean. So it's going to use all the intercepts, it's going to calculate all the cumulative probabilities, take successive differences in them, multiply them by the Y values, add that up. And we're going to get the predicted mean separately by group by translating the regular linear predictor with this capital M mean function. So now look at the predicted means for the four samples, and we have approximate uh, upper and lower 95% confidence intervals. And then um, if we were to summarize the, the data by just stratifying a group and taking the regular mean and the regular normal um, uh, type of confidence interval. You see 98.7 to 130. How does that compare to what we had from the proportional odds model? 99 to 129 and the, the widths of the confidence intervals are also very similar. So we were able um, to reproduce the sample means where the sample estimates are just stratified and don't assume anything like a connection between the distributions we were able to reproduce those really accurately um, by actually connecting the distributions by the proportional odds assumption. But you can also get these pairwise contrasts. So we're going to use a very general contrast function in the RMS package. And that says we want to contrast group C with group B. So you read this as group C minus group B. And we're going to get the contrast on the um, log odds ratio scale. So that is the log odds ratio for going from B to C. So there was a, an increase, a big increase. There's a standard error, and there's confidence intervals, and a Z statistic and p-value for testing the difference between B and C. And then we can also analog the, uh, the numbers up there. Now we have, instead of the log odds ratio 1.24, we have an odds ratio of 3.4 and we have a lower and upper 0.95 confidence interval for the odds ratio for comparing uh, B and C. And you could compare them also by getting predicted means or medians off of this model.
So now we're going to take something that we analyzed with the Wilcoxon test in the previous session, and we're going to reanalyze it with the proportional odds model. So you'll recall uh, we had a p-value of 0.0068 in this calprotectin data, um, and we had a C-index of 0.837. If we do a proportional odds model in the frequentist paradigm, uh, we have to tell the RMS package something about the data distribution. And then we model this with the default link function of logit. CalPro is modeled as the grouping variable endo. And we're going to print that along with the intercepts because we don't have so many this time. We get a frequency distribution of all of our data. There's no ties in the data until you get to the upper detection limit. That's not going to present any problem in terms of um, a rank-based analysis. And it won't present any problem in estimating the median. It would present a problem in estimating the mean. So the likelihood ratio chi-score is 9.8. The p-value is 0.0017. So we just said it was 0.0068 using the Wilcoxon test. So this this p-value is uh, smaller than what we got with the Wilcoxon test. Then you see all these intercepts, and then you have the one uh, beta one hat for your group effect as you go from the reference group to the other group. Intercepts correspond to cutoffs for getting exceedance probabilities, and so we start with the second lowest value of y, and when you're trying to get an estimate of the probability that y is greater than or equal to one of these numbers, let's say greater than or equal to 483, you would take this intercept and plug that into your regular logistic model along with your beta 1 hat. And that, once you go 1 over 1 plus e to the minus that, you'll get the estimated probability that calprotectin is greater than or equal to 483. So just pick off the right intercept and you have what you need in terms of getting these simple exceedance probabilities. Um, so this is the one that corresponds to being 2500 or greater and, and that means if you're at or above the upper limit of detection this coefficient will apply. So there were 18 intercepts for 19 distinct y values and those represent the logit of the empirical cumulative distribution function for the reference group if the two groups are in proportional odds. And then you would add 2.75 to the intercepts to get the logit CDF for the moderate severe group. Now when I'm saying CDF, I'm really talking here about 1 minus CDF because we're talking about exceedance and not less than or equal to. Now we're going to get um, odds ratio, and we're going to make no or mild activity be our reference group. Remember the uh, earlier comment, these, these should not have been combined. We should really have four levels um, because we have two other levels that are combined. But for illustration purposes, we're going to get the effects in the model, and this is going to be our comparison group. So you see that if you compare the no or mild to moderate or severe, you bump the log odds by 2.75, you get a confidence interval, and if you analog that, you get an odds ratio of 15.7. So there's quite a shift, uh, quite an effect, uh, depending on which group you're in, of the calprotectin distribution. By the proportional odds assumption, the odds ratio of 15.7 uh, 15.8 is the same for all cutoffs of y. Uh, now I, I have some simulations that show an approximate formula for getting the C index that we talked about in the Wilcoxon test uh, using the proportional odds model coefficients and this is this empirical formula here that works pretty well over a, a lot of situations. It didn't work super well here uh, because it estimated a concordance probability. Probability a randomly chosen uh, member of group B will be higher than a randomly chosen member in group A is 0.857, and the real calculation of the C index is 0.837. So from the fitted proportional odds model, we can obtain for each group uh, along uh, the various sample estimates.
so we can calculate the probability that the calprotectin is at or above the upper limit of normal. We can calculate the mean or the median. The median is okay. Uh, the mean is really dicey because we're we're putting 2,500 in um, instead of knowing the real value that was truncated by the detection limit. So we have these functions that um, are provided by the RMS package. And um, one of the functions is exceedance probability, EX prob, that will create a function that will calculate the exceedance probability given the cutoff. We're going to use a cutoff of 2,500. We talked about the mean function generator, and then there's a quantile function generator. And the particular quantile that we're going to estimate is going to be the 0.5 quantile or median. So the first thing we're going to do is to predict or estimate the exceedance probabilities, probability of being at or above the detection limit, as a function of the grouping variable. Um, and that is uh, these numbers here. And um, so this is the using the exceedance probability function to transform the linear predictor. And so we get a probability of being at or above 2,500 of 0.04 versus the second group is 0.41. Quite a difference. And we have some good confidence intervals for that. Uh, just to compare that with the empirical data, which is going to be pretty noisy because you're not borrowing any information from the first group to the second, but the mean or proportion that's exceeding this is 0.125 versus 0.39. You can compare that to what we just estimated from the model, just a little bit different. Uh, but these model estimates are assuming proportional odds, and these simple stratified proportions are not. Um, so now we can get the estimated means, the 300 versus 1387, not to be trusted too much because of that limit problem, but we can get stratified means and we get 400 versus 1372, not very different, and that also suffers from the detection problem, unlike the median. So these are the estimated medians, 69 and 940. So you can see you can get a lot of different quantities uh, out of the model, and these are the empirical medians. Um, instead of 70 and 940, we got 88 and 976, not so far off. Now we're going to turn to checking the assumptions of the Wilcoxon test. Um, the proportional odds model and its special cases assume proportional odds. What does it really mean to assume proportional odds? Well, under the null hypothesis that the distributions are the same in the groups, uh, the odds ratio is 1. And if the odds ratio is 1, you know, the everything is in proportional odds. There's no treatment effect. And, um, and the type 1 error will be exactly as you advertise it. Uh, but what about under the alternative hypothesis where there is a difference in the populations? The test may still work okay. It just won't be optimal. It won't have its ideal power and efficiency in less proportional odds holes. So that's what it means to assume proportional odds. It means you're assuming it for the results to be optimal. It doesn't mean the proportionalized assumption has to exactly hold for things to be reasonably okay. Now what about checking proportional odds? We would like to have, to have a way to do that when the y variable is fairly continuous. Uh, there's other ways to do this when you have a discrete ordinal variable. Um, so what we do is we compute the empirical cumulative distribution function, ECDF, for the response variable stratified by group and then we take the logit transformation and we plot the transformed ECDFs and check for parallelism. It's really that easy. Now, we're checking for parallelism. We're not checking for linearity of those uh, curves. Linearity would be needed if you're using a parametric logistic distribution instead of our semi-parametric. So if you didn't have all these intercepts in the model that's modeling the empirical distribution so flexibly, then um, you would need these transform ECDFs to actually be linear. Uh, 
We don't need that. We just need them to be parallel. Now contrast that with what the t-test requires. It not only requires parallelism, but it requires linearity uh, when you inverse normal transform the ECDFs. What does linearity correspond to? That's, that's checking that you have a normal distribution. So taking the normal inverse of the ECDF is like making a QQ plot. And then what does parallelism of the curves mean? It means equal variances in the two groups. Now the problem is in checking those assumptions is when your sample size is small, uh, the ECDFs are too noisy to really see much. And so this is uh, sort of for larger sample sizes. Um, and so we're going to take a larger sample size. This is from the famous Mayo Clinic uh, primary biliary cirrhosis data set. And in the HMIS package in our, this GetH data uh, function will find that data set on our website, on our data sets page, and we'll download it and, and load it into R for you. So we're going to get the PBC data set, and then we're going to do an empirical cumulative distribution of serum bilirubin stratified by whether or not the patients with primary biliary cirrhosis have these uh, spider vein signs or not. So that's our grouping variable. PBC is our data set. And when we take the ECDF, we're going to transform it. QLogis is just the logit function that's built into R. So when you get the stratified transformed ECDF, uh, which see it, it goes from like minus 5 to 5 instead of 0 to 1, when you stratify that by spiders present or absent, what you don't want to look for is linearity of these. This is a semi-parametric test. The shape of the distribution of any one group doesn't matter at all. But what we do assume is some kind of similarity in the shape as you go from absent to present for spider. And so we need these to be equidistant. Now, we're really running out of data over here. Uh, this is reasonably parallel until you get right over here, and it stays very parallel. This actually doesn't look parallel, but it is. So you're talking about vertical distance, something that's very steep. The human eye is very poor at estimating vertical distance. But if you took out a ruler and looked at these vertical distances, they're not very different from this at all. So this is pretty good evidence that the proportional odds assumption is satisfied, and we feel good about using the Wilcoxon test or the proportional odds model. Now what about checking t-test assumptions? Well, we take the empirical cumulative distribution function and we transform it by the normal inverse or q-norm function. So it looks very similar. The, the normal inverse isn't that different from the logit ex except way out in the tails. And so we see just as good parallelism as what we had before. That means the equal variance assumption is looking good. Uh, but the parametric test needs not just parallelism, but on this scale it needs linearity. So from here to here that's pretty linear, but this is drastically nonlinear. So the normal distribution assumption that's necessary for the t-test to have reasonable power is really violated here. So now we're going to get into a discussion of power and sample size. And the way most people handle this, say, in grant proposals that I see, is they just say, okay, we're going to do the Wilcoxon test because we think it's more powerful and it's, we know it's robust. Um, but we're going to assume the power is kind of similar to a t-test and we may have a variance estimate from other data. And we're going to use the t-test formula for power to get the proximate power for the Wilcoxon test. That's assuming normality and usually assuming equal variances. And if, if you really did have normality, as you're assuming here, the Wilcoxon test will be just slightly inefficient. Its efficiency is 3 over pi. So whatever uh, sample size you got from using the t-test, if you wanted to be pretty honest about it, you'd multiply it by pi over 3 or 1.047 to get the approximate sample size needed for this slightly inefficient um, Wilcoxon test. But what happens if, 
you, if it goes the other way, what if the response distribution within group is very far from normal? Well, then this approach is not going to work. I mean, the standard deviation is not even going to be a good measure of variability. Uh, so how do you get something that's very non-normal that will cause a problem? Well, you might have clumping in the Y distribution. Often we have clumping at zero. Uh, you might have a floor effect, which is like clumping at zero, but it might be at a different value. You might have a ceiling effect. So you might be using a, a four-level pain scale, um, and, and you might have um, the scale tied down at the low and high values, give, giving a floor and ceiling effect. You might have a very asymmetric distribution or it may have heavy tails. So in any of these cases, you're gonna have meaningful non-normality that makes the t-test not only not work in practice when you have the data, but not be a good basis for a power calculation. So, so now we need a more general approach that's a little more honest uh, towards the Wilcoxon test. We're not going to cover this next section, but it's, it's another take on how do you derive the relative efficiency of the Wilcoxon test um, that you might be interested in. So I'll let you look at that if you're, if you're interested. So now we go into tailoring the power calculations to, to the Wilcoxon test. And now that we can embed the Wilcoxon test inside the proportional, proportional odds model, we can use what Whitehead developed uh, where he developed very nice formulas based on the score test from the proportional odds model. Now, to do this, we're assuming there's a frequency tabulated distribution estimate available for the combined groups. And so when you have uh, floor and ceiling effects, this really comes in handy, but to really, really optimize the calculations to handle these floor and ceiling effects and other non-normalities, uh, you really would need to have the whole tabulation of frequency counts at all the distinct values from some reasonable sample from a previous study. Now the power is computed as a function of the group 2 to group 1 odds ratio for the exceedance probabilities and we can convert those to means and medians which we'll do below. And then note that when the odds ratio is 1 the distributions are the same so the differences in means have to be 0 and the differences in medians have to be zero. Now there are very simple to use functions in the HMIS package for calculating power of the two group comparison for proportional odds model and Wilcoxon PL power or for calculating the sample size to achieve a certain power. That's a PO SAM size function. So our example is gonna start with a discrete case we have uh, clumping at zero, so 0.3 of all of our observations are going to be assumed to be zero. And then we're gonna have uniformly distributed data across these levels. Now for the proportional odds of Wilcoxon, the actual values here are not used. This could be one, two, three, four, five, and so on. They're not used until you translate the odds ratio into the mean. So this is how we generate a uh, frequency vector. So we're going to have frequency of 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0.1, all the way out, seven of those. So this says to compute the power to detect an odds ratio of 1.25 with a combined sample size of 1,000 if this was your distribution of your combined groups. So if it had these probabilities, these discrete probabilities, of being at all those values of y, uh, this is this will give you the power for that. And the power uh, with a thousand and an odds ratio that's not too huge is only 0.516. And there's a calculation that comes out of this, which is how efficient is this dependent variable compared to a truly continuous dependent variable that has no ties in it. So we see that. Uh, having eight levels of an ordinal variable here, even with some clumping at zero, is pretty darn efficient. Um, now we're going to get the sample size needed to achieve a power of 0.9 to detect an odds ratio of 1.25 with a Wilcoxon test, uh, 
we need a total sample size of 2621. Now uh, we're going to translate odds ratios to other things and we're going to start by showing if you had these probabilities and you wanted to shift them by an odds ratio of 1.25 uh, you would get these altered uh, cell probabilities. So that was 0.3 before, now that's down to 0.25. And these are all, they're all shifted. And by the proportional odds assumption, these probabilities are not all equal as they were uh, before we had an uh, odds ratio different from 1. Now if we associate values with those probabilities so that we can get the uh, mean properly. This is the formula for the weighted mean uh, using these frequencies of in P and we have a mean of 12.7. So let's vary the odds ratio from the null case to 1.05, 1.1, 1.2 all the way up to 2 and we're going to for each of those run this uh, PL mod M function which is documented with the PL power function. So we're going to take those probabilities and those x values and we're going to um, alter these p's under a certain odds ratio and then we're going to get from that this calculates the mean and the median. And so if the odds ratio is 1 that means we have the original mean that we already saw was 12.7 and the median is, is 3 and now you see the mean is creeping up. It just goes up a little bit with a very small odds ratio. Once the odds ratio is 2, we've gone from a mean of 12.7 to a mean of 20. We've gone from a median of 3 to a median of 9.9. .9. So this is how you can translate uh, odds ratios to means and medians. If you have a metric scale, such as an interval scale, like this one here, to associate with these cell probabilities. What about if we had a normal distribution for Y? So let's suppose the response variable in the control group is normal with a mean of 100 and the standard deviation is 10. Um, and then we're going to assume the experimental arm has the same distribution as control except the mean is shifted up by 3 units. So that will result in slight non-proportional odds. So the Wilcoxon test is not optimal, but it will still be um, it will still be almost totally efficient. Now when the sample size per group is 150, the power of the t-test to detect a three unit difference in the means can be found from this function in the PWR package, power.ttest and we state the difference in standard deviation units that we want to detect and you can see the power of the two sample t-test to detect a difference of 3 when the standard deviation is 10 is 0.74. To get the power of the Wilcoxon test we can use simulation to get the power exactly to within simulation error without making really any statistical approximations. So we're going to run a thousand studies and we're going to, for each study, draw a sample uh, of size 150 with a mean of 100, standard deviation 10, and a second sample where the mean is now three units greater. And then we're going to do the Wilcoxon two sample test for those data from the two samples and we're going to save the p-values. Now what proportion of the p-values were less than 0.05 well, for an alpha 0.05 level test, that is the definition of the power, and the power is 0.71. So under this normal distribution, uh, which gives us slight non-proportional odds, we get a 0.71 where the uh, t-test had a power of about 0.74. Now we can actually run a simulation uh, using this other function that comes with the package we're going to just run 300 uh, simulations because this is taking a little bit of time. Um, I'm sorry, this is 400 simulations and our sample size is 300. Our delta to detect is 3. Standard deviation is 10. 
and the power we get is 0.71, which is the same as the um, uh, simulation we did using the, no the non-parametric test instead of our semi-parametric model. Now for the Wilcoxon test to be optimal, uh, shifting the distribution, as we said, uh, results um, in a non-Gaussian it results in a non-Gaussian distribution. What we said before, we were talking about uh, shifting by having two normal distributions gives you slightly non-proportional odds. So what if we want to do proportional odds? If we start with a normal distribution in the reference group and we shift that distribution by a given odds ratio, that will result in a non-normal distribution, be slightly non-normal for the experimental arm. We're going to solve for the odds ratio that shifts the mean from 100 to 103, and then we're going to assume proportional odds and compute the power. Uh, so without going through details in the code, it, it's all done here. And when you plot, when you uh, solve for the needed odds ratio, that will be equivalent to adding 3 to the mean to make it go to 103. That's an odds ratio of about 1.71. But you can see in the graph, we, we can show that for a variety of odds ratios. So when the odds ratio is 1, you're not adding anything to the mean. And as the odds ratio goes up, you're shifting the mean in the second group. And at this 1.7, you can see we've shifted it by 3 units. Now, what if we get the power of the proportional odds model test or Wilcoxon test, when you have an odds ratio to detect that gives you the equivalent of a shift of three units on the mean. So we've seen that's an odds ratio of about 1.71. And so when you run that power calculation quickly with PL power, uh, you get a power of 0.761. Uh, and so that's even coming out higher than the power of the t-test. So this is showing what happens when the Wilcoxon test is super optimal but because it's operating under the ideal situation where the proportional odds assumption is true. Let's check how non-normal the experimental arm responses would be if the proportional odds uh, assumption holds but the effect is much bigger, an odds ratio of 10. So those calculations will do that and um, we see that we get a normal distribution uh, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. We get these exceedance probabilities ex assuming that normal distribution. And then to translate it to the second group's distribution, you take the log odds of those exceedance probabilities, add your log odds ratio, and then you inverse transform that. Uh, to get the exceedance probabilities um, in the for the second group. And we can plot the new CDF versus the normal approximation, making the normal approximation agree at the quartiles. And you see um, this little bit of difference in the curves is sort of telling you how much proportional odds is mattering. And it's, it's not not a whole lot. Uh, we can also show the theoretical QQ plot. This is checking for linearity of the inverse normally transformed experimental arm. So the experimental arm had cumulative probabilities generated by the logistic shape. Uh, and now we're inverse normal transforming that logistic sort of CDF. Uh, and because the normal distribution is slightly different from the logistic CDF, you'll see that this line is, is not uh, exactly on the line of identity. So it's like a QQ plot checking for uh, logisticness or checking for proportional odds. Um, we can also do this by generating a discrete distribution and modifying it under an odds ratio. Uh, I won't really go through those calculations, but you get something that's a little bit like we had before. Now the next thing we're going to look at is the situation where you have a heavy-tailed response variable, and we want to get the power to detect a shift in the mean of 0.3 units 
for a heavy-tailed control distribution, like say from a placebo group, and we're going to make it heavy-tailed by having a t-distribution for the raw data with four degrees of freedom. We're going to have 150 subjects per group. Now the t-test is going to have a big loss of power, and the mean and standard deviation are no longer optimal, e even optimal data summaries. Uh, but we can get the Wilcoxon power quickly if we're willing to assume proportional odds. And instead of assuming proportional odds, let's use simulation to get something we can really trust. And it's actually very quick. And compare that with the power of the t-test. So for the null case, delta is 0, we're going to do the simulation. And we're going to repeat it for the non-null case with a shift of 0.3 upward. So we're going to do all these simulations. We're going to get our raw data sampled from a t-distribution with 4 degrees of freedom, 150 sample size, and then a t-distribution that shifted to the right by adding 0.3, or 0 under the null case. Then we're going to save the p-values for the two different types of tests. So an interesting way to look at this is the proportion of simulations where the p-value for the Wilcoxon test is less than the p-value for the t-test. So I've just written a function capital P uh, to be the proportion function, which is just the mean function, and we're rounding it to two digits. What's the probability that the p-value is smaller for Wilcoxon than it is for t-test? That's a signal of efficiency. And then we're going to get the average p-value for the methods and the power, which is the proportion of p-values less than 0.05 or the probability the p-value will be less than 0.05. So we see for the normal case uh, the p-values have the same mean and the Wilcoxon p-values are not systematically any different than the t-test p-values. The power uh, for both of these should be 0.05 because this is the null case and we got um, um, although we're not having exact proportional odds here but we're getting a power that's right at 0.05. But what about the non-null case? Well, 73% of the time, the p-value for Wilcoxon was lower than the p-value for the t-test, indicating an efficiency gain. And we can look at that two other ways. The mean p-value for the t-test is 0.17, and it's lower for the Wilcoxon. More to what we're used to seeing, the power for the t-test is only 0.47, but the power for the Wilcoxon test is 0.6. So the Wilcoxon test is significantly better power than the t-test in this very non-normal non -normal situation with heavy tails. Uh, there's a note here that you can use the simreg or function to do a simulation for a covariate adjusted comparison if you had a single uh, adjustment covariate. Now we're going to finish today's session by just briefly mentioning the Bayesian proportional odds model. Um, you can readily extend proportional odds model to the Bayesian framework. You do have to p uh, pay some attention to specifying the priors for the intercepts. This can be important. Uh, Nathan James at Vanderbilt is doing a lot of uh, work on that. And there's some other notes here and links that you may find interesting. Uh, and a, a blog article about using the BRMS package to do ordinal, uh, do a Bayesian proportional odds model. What you get out of the Bayesian proportional odds model, instead of getting a p-value, uh, you would get the probability that beta 1 is greater than 0, or any probability statement about the treatment effect. So what are the advantages of Bayes for proportional odds models where you don't need any approximations such as large sample normality for beta hat or chi-square distribution for your likelihood ratio uh, test. You just have simulations. You have simulation error, but you just do a lot of simulations. The inference is much more interpretable and direct. Uh, most non-statisticians understand it more readily. And if they say they understand p-values better, they're usually not telling the truth. Uh, you can bring outside information to the analysis. You can incorporate skepticism, which is a way of doing penalization or shrinkage uh, that will bring stability to the analysis.
and still have exact inference and common interpretation. You automatically obtain exact distributions and credible intervals for derived quantities. Now this is actually a pretty big deal. So if you wanted to get a credible interval for a predicted mean from the proportional odds model, uh, that's very hard to do. Uh, it's very hard to get a confidence interval in the frequentist proportional odds model. But it's a simple derived quantity in the Bayesian framework, and you just do your posterior draws of your parameters, calculate your derived quantity a few thousand times, and instantly get your credible interval by taking quantiles of those uh, draws of your derived quantity, such as the mean. Another advantage is you can relax the proportional odds assumption without adding huge instabilities that result uh, from using polytomous logistic regression, which we haven't talked about. In other words, you can have uh, prior distributions that favor proportional odds while allowing for non-proportional odds. So that's a whirlwind uh, look at the Bayesian proportional odds model, which has a lot of advantages. And I hope you've enjoyed the session. Look forward to your questions on datamethods.org, and I will see you next time.